Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the paintings of Henri Matisse, which were at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, we'll more or less be examining paintings that were at the museum, as well as some others in his work, and talking about uh, perhaps some of his, uh, the positive aspects of his work, as well as maybe some of the weaknesses. You know, Matisse is one of the gods of 20th century painting, but gods have a way of, of changing, and perhaps we'll get into a little bit of reinterpretation of Matisse from the point of view of uh, today's vision of art and what it may be evolving into. Okay, why don't we go to the first uh, picture. And uh, here we have an early still life uh, by Matisse called Lemons and uh, with Dutch gin bottle that was at the exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. And I do wish to thank the museum for loaning many of the photographs that will uh, appear on the pro program, many of the paintings. Uh, this is painted about 1896, and obviously this is not the Matisse that we are uh, very familiar with as one of the innovators of 20th century painting, perhaps along with Picasso, the two major painters of the 20th century. And it's dark, it's, it's heavy in color, the paint is built up thickly in an impasto with much glazing that gives a richness to the forms and so forth. But Matisse is studying nature as a, perhaps as the first thing that a painter should study as well as other painters, gaining a control of his forms and learning simply what a painting is, at least this stage of his career. Uh, he's about, uh, what is he, about 28, uh, 29 years old at this point. Okay, why don't we go to the next uh, picture? And we'll see uh, one of his later paintings that was also at the Museum of Modern Art uh, called Male Model, painted about 1900, and we'll see a considerable change having taken place in his work during that period. Uh, an obvious influence of some of the important modern painters of the late 19th century, Matisse born about 1869, will die 1953 or 4. Uh, obviously, in the plainer handling of the figure, there's a sense of the substance and form of Cezanne, a certain geometrization of the forms. And we can't see the color on good old black and white, but just the way he's broken up the space in the background is a handle, is Cezanne-esque, if we can say it that way, in the handling of the space. And the color it would be sort of Cezanne blues, blue greens, and violets in the background building the sense of space. Okay, well, why don't we go to the next picture? And in the one coming up, the very well-known woman with a hat, which was not in the exhibition, painted about 1905, is incredibly rich in color and is one of those that brought great furor and we might say fame as well to Matisse about 1905 during the exhibition that became known as the, uh, that gave Matisse and his fellow painters the name of Fauve, F-A-U-V-E-S, Fauves, uh, Wild Beasts because of a tremendous rich use of color freely applied uh, both to model form and for expressive purposes. You know, obviously we can sense perhaps in the freedom of the brushwork, if not in the color, certain influences of, of Cezanne, Van Gogh, perhaps Gauguin in the handling of the paint. But Matisse obviously is not through in terms of where his artistic evolution is going to lead him from this rough, free expressiveness around 1905. Uh, we'll move to the period in the next picture, 1908-1909, uh, called uh, The Dessert or Harmony in Red. And of course, there will be a tremendous difference in the, in the picture. Uh, obviously what's happened, the paint has become smoother, the forms have become flatter, the picture space has become flattened and two-dimensional, and we're looking at Matisse perhaps in essence as he will remain throughout his career, one aspect of his work, uh, which is richly decorated with an intricacy of design shapes and relationships. The opposite pole of Matisse, we'll see a little bit later, will be of extreme simplicity, but he'll vary between those two poles of expression. And uh, it's this kind of painting in Harmony in Red, 1908, 1909, something like that, that will be of the greatest influence on painters of the 20th century. Uh, where Ma this is where we get into the description of Matisse as a great decorator, as someone who can manipulate the aesthetics of art, arrange shape and color on the surface of the canvas. 
Now, he, he is brilliant at this. You know, we look at the picture, it's beautifully designed, every shape, and if we could see color, seems to be in just the appropriate expressive design place. But on the other side hand of being a decorator, is there's a certain implied weakness in terms of the expressive content in the painting. The emotion, the emotionalism perhaps in a painting, the idea that goes into the painting, a certain inner meaning uh, will be a little bit lacking in some of Matisse's pictures. And though the woman here, her head is bowed and she's stylized, one senses a certain sadness in the f f uh, figure, in the face of the figure. The writhing, twisting of the lines suggests something of the serpentine whiplash quality of Art Nouveau line. But generally speaking, we're going into that realm of, of decoration without a great deal of emotional depth or expressive depth to the work. Okay, let's go down to one below that. Again, to see where Matisse has gone, we keep in mind that one interior with a dinner table and a woman working around the table and so forth. And we go back to an earlier picture painted uh, under the influence of the Impressionists and working his way through various schools of painting, uh, studying with Gustave Moreau and others. And uh, also entitled The Dinner Table, we see how far he went. Uh, the present dinner table painted in 1897. And obviously, it's a magnificent painting in terms of, of the control of the media, the forms, the solidity of it, the glints of light that he so beautifully expresses on the, uh, the crockery and so forth. But he has abandoned that particular style forever. And perhaps his paintings will never again be as solid as this, although a little bit of Cezanne will creep in and will have the, the Cezanne-esque geometric kind of form. OK, why don't we go to the next uh, picture? You know, keep in mind that earlier dessert, Harmony in Red, it was essentially an interior, uh, warmly painted, increasingly two-dimensional. And we look now at uh, Van Gogh's famous painting of his bedroom. Uh, I'm not saying Matisse is specifically influenced by the bedroom, but we, we see another interior, and we see a different kind of interior, one in which decoration is apparent in terms of the placement of objects. Van Gogh is a great artist. And therefore, by definition, a great artist must be a great decorator, must arrange his painting, must arrange the elements of art on the surface of his painting well. But in addition to that, there's the great feeling that's in the picture, the sense of, of loneliness in it, uh, the sense of this humble bedroom, uh, a place of, of escape from a world, a place of refuge from a world that doesn't appreciate Van Gogh's, indeed is hostile to him as at the time in Arles in southern France when people are calling him crazy and uh, throwing stone, kids are throwing stones at him, following him around as he goes out to paint, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm saying that Matisse, I'm going to be saying throughout the program that Matisse is a significant painter. He's one of the significant painters of the 20th century, but perhaps he is not as significant, does not rise to the level of someone like Van Gogh simply because he is a decorator more than he is plunger and expressor of the human soul, the human spirit. I, th I think those people who do that, those artists who do that, must, it must remain for them the designation of great artists. OK, why don't we go to the next uh, picture. And um, we'll see again briefly, we're, we'll pass through a, a couple of the post-impressionists who are primarily those who lay the groundwork for Matisse and influence him and is a very well-known uh, Seurat's very well-known painting, uh, Le Grand Jat. And we see here this concern for surface decoration, the using of the figure not so much as a human element, although there is a sense of humanity to them, but they become uh, more design elements. They're becoming flattened. They're becoming stylized. They're becoming, to a certain extent, de-individualized. Uh, particularly in, in this picture, where some of the figures, perhaps the couple on the right, the woman in the center with the umbrella, are almost like uh, pillars or columns on a temple, Greek temple of a sort. So, and obviously there's much more sense of three-dimensional depth in this, but Seurat is one of those artists who laid the groundwork uh, for Matisse. Okay, let's go to the next picture. And we keep in mind a certain impersonality in Seurat in Le Grand Jatte. And, and I think right in pictures of that type where is laid the groundwork for the widespread uh, generalized depersonalization of painting that we see today uh, in painting throughout the world. Uh, but 
in a painting by Toulouse-Lautrec uh, at the Moulin Rouge, another wonderful picture, uh, a great painting, I would say. Uh, marvelous in its char human characterization. Here these people are real. They're, they have a sense of spirit, of personality. There's a sense of uh, soul in the people, if we want to say, put it that way. But they're also two-dimensionalized shapes. They're not as extreme as Matisse has carried his two-dimensionalizing of the human figure, his flattening of them. And one must say, when one flattens, when one two-dimensionalizes, one is moving away from the world. It's the third dimension that gives the reality of space and spatial relationships in the world. Uh, Two-dimensionalizing, obviously, is becoming otherworldly and may or not may or may not be becoming spiritualized in a sense. So Lautrec is another precursor to Matisse, perhaps not directly, but just in terms of the increasing two-dimensionalization of space. But in Lautrec, there is human presence, a, a sense of the depth of human personality and individual human personality that will be lacking in Matisse and many painters of the 20th century. OK, why don't we go to the, uh, the next one. And uh, one of the painters influenced by Matisse during the 20th century, of course, is Robert Motherwell. There are, are many, many others. We could mention Richard Diebenkorn as someone obviously uh, influenced by Matisse in terms of the two-dimensional space uh, that they're dealing with and, and shape arrangements and so forth. And Motherwell's Elegy to the Spanish Republic, one of the pictures in that series, uh, we see extreme simplification of the type that Matisse will go toward. There's more expressionistic quality to this in terms of the impact of the black against the white, the, the characteristic abstract expressionist drips. But I think that if a person will objectively compare uh, the, pre the successors of Matisse, uh, they not only reveal how strong a painter Matisse is, but that the, the followers of Matisse, the successors, are not as effective painters. They're not as deeply uh, rooted uh, either in their art or their art is not uh, as significant as Matisse's because they, they seem to be more empty, uh, semi-empty manipulators of the Matisse tradition so that people like Motherwell and Diemenkorn uh, I don't believe will be considered to be uh, significant painters of our time although they have substantial reputations at the present. Why don't we go to the next picture? And uh, we can go to the next picture now. And we'll see another a painting by uh, Paul Cezanne. And of course, uh, Matisse idolized Cezanne in terms of what he'd done uh, in terms of pictorial structure, in terms of simplification. Matisse, uh, in terms of breaking up space on the picture surface, Matisse will never deal with form as sol uh, solidly and succinctly as Cezanne does. But uh, in this portrait of uh, Vallard, the very influential art dealer in France who was one of the first to give Cezanne a start and will show pieces by uh, Matisse and other avant-garde artists of the time. Uh, but we're not so much interested in the painting so much, or even the figure, as in the upper left-hand corner of the figure. And why don't we, in this instance, pan the camera up and take in both the mother well and the upper left-hand corner of the picture. And we see what we see in the upper left-hand corner of the picture. And, and no, pan left. Don't pull away. Get a close-up. I don't care about the uh, Cezanne's head. I want to see the two pictures, the corner of the Cezanne and the mother well. Yeah, that's a ticket. That's beautiful. And it almost appears that Motherwell has taken that single tiny segment of Cezanne's painting with the, the windows and the implied uh, geometrized, geometrized uh, handles of the window and made a total painting statement out of that one tiny segment of a Cezanne, of a Cezanne masterpiece, we might add. And perhaps, very, in a nutshell, very succinctly, we do have an example of the problem that faces 20th century painting in that we, whether Motherwell did that deliberately or it just happens that way, uh, the shapes come up spontaneously. It does imply and point out some of the limitations of 20th century painting. What a narrow focus 20th century artists have 
um, what a narrow area of art they focused on and, and therefore why it is essentially weak in our time. Okay, why don't we go to the next uh, picture. Painting by Picasso. We're talking about Villard and we see Picasso's portrait of that same dealer, obviously uh, in a Cubist style. And of course Cubism and the fracturing of the surface of the plane, surface of a picture is directly expressive of the effect of 20th century life on mankind. You know, the, the fracturing of his life, the dislocation of his, his physical body as well as his spiritual values and his social values and so forth, uh, as well as the effect of Cezanne and primitive art and so forth. It's interesting that in this particular painting of, of Vollard that Cezanne holds back on the head, you know, because he doesn't want to totally destroy the reality of Villard here in, in the sense, and I'm sure it wasn't commissioned, but he wants to keep the identity of Villard where in some paintings of, of guitar players, anonymous guitar players and nudes, uh, the total of the head and everything will disintegrate into the cubist, typical cubist faceting. Okay, why don't we go down to the, uh, <clears throat> to the next painting. We come back to Matisse. And in the uh, woman, the uh, sculpture and goldfish bowl painted about 1911, which, which is in the uh, Museum of Modern Art exhibition. Incidentally, all of the pictures at that show were part of the museum uh, collection. We do see in the, the breaking up of the space and the certain angularity in it, uh, the effect of cubism uh, from Picasso. This is about as far as Matisse will go. We'll see some of further touches in the piano lesson coming up, but Matisse in the next series of pictures becomes extremely spare, searching for an extreme of simplicity. And of course, uh, that has been one of the major goals of 20th century painting. Simplicity, uh, purity, quote unquote, and um, uh, perhaps at the expense of a certain uh, richness of form, richness of variety of form. Okay, we went to the next picture, a painting of Notre Dame, uh, painted in 1914 and we see that same spare abstract breaking up the surface. And here we see very clearly where Diebenkorn and Motherwell spring from, how those lines articulate the, the shallow space and um, uh, lead to this great simplicity, a great austerity. There's a certain austere uh, expressiveness here. Uh, but people are beginning to react in our time to this great spareness. Uh, over severe quality in painting, and perhaps that's the reason why, uh, perhaps you saw the article by Hilton Kramer in the Times re relating to Victorian art, and it, it's a god-awful art. We can go to the next uh, picture. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible, uh, terribly sentimental and weak kind of painting, but it does have uh, a, a richness of, often of texture or of the handling of uh, pseudo-realistic forms and a terribly sentimentalized content, but at least there are content that sets off the spareness of Matisse and others. Okay, let's look at the next painting. And uh, uh, we look at, very quickly, we'll look at the El Greco uh, burial of Count Orgaz, you know, painted, you know, back in the, what is it, 16th century, early 16th century, perhaps, perhaps late 15th. Uh, yeah, late 15th, early 16th. Uh, just for the contrast of the great richness of the of the forms, the, the, if you talk about decoration of a canvas, here's a beautifully rich, intricately decorated surface of a canvas. So, uh, perhaps it's something like this is what we've been missing in much of 20th century painting, particularly when we reach the level of, uh, the, of Ellsworth Kelly and people of that sort who simply uh, apply a single color. Okay, let's go to the next piece. Uh, very uh, quickly, we see Matisse's well-known piano lesson which is at the uh, modern, of course. And uh, it, it's a beautiful painting. So I'm not really attempting to denigrate Matisse. I, I think he's a significant painter. And when you see these in color and in full size, you know, perhaps seven, eight feet high, five, six feet wide, they're impressive. The man um, is a painter. He is a genuine artist. Uh, they're beautifully constructed in, in the shallow, two-dimensional format of 20th century painting. But uh, one wonders when looking before these whether indeed it will be seen as enough 
as, as fully satisfying enough as probing totally uh, deeply enough. But, but they're beautiful, and they're, they're one senses Matisse's significance compared to his followers. OK, let's uh, go to the next one. And uh, we're waiting for just, yeah, that's a ticket. That's a ticket. And uh, we do a little bit of, of juggling here. And uh, we're informal. We're after ideas, as we say. <laughs> we're not after a show business facade here. So we go to the next piece of Matisse, the uh, rose marble. Uh, table, garden table, painted in the late, uh, painted 1917, and perhaps in a picture like this, extremely simple, obviously Matisse working with shapes again, but in the darkness of it, there's a mood to it, a certain sense of lonely grandeur, perhaps a single lighted form standing amidst the dark of the foliage and so forth. This has expressiveness. It is expressive. You know, it has what is unusual for Matisse, does have mood, feeling. OK, let's go to the next uh, piece, if we can. And we see the uh, opposite extreme of the great simplicity of Matisse, uh, the richly decorated uh, and aptly titled decorative figure against an ornamental uh, ground. And the fig, the background is, uh, has a lot of cur beautiful curving shapes. I we'll get to it. Here we go. And this is Matisse at his finest in this total decorative splendor with, with wonderful shapes and colors working over the total surface of the picture. And, and nothing is out of place. And, and uh, nothing is more difficult than to control these, this rampant series of, of marvelously individual, creative, living shapes. And, and Matisse is a past master at it. And it's a marvelous painting. OK, let's go to the next picture. And it, the next is a photograph of Matisse at work from a model. And really, he's, he's posing. Perhaps he was working on the model, but obviously he's posing for the benefit of the camera. But we will see in a moment some of the uh, setting of his studio. Perhaps we can pan up and down the photograph and, and see some of the texture that's in it, the fabric that hangs down at the top, that, the well-known screen on the left above his head that appears in, in some of his paintings. And he loves the, the rich combination of textures and a certain oriental exoticism, which is implied by dressing the model in an odalisk's costume or a harem girl's costume. OK, we'll quickly go to the, the next picture. Uh, painted about in the 1940s, a uh, still life with lemons and a plant against a fleur de lis background. We're just uh, getting details of this, but, which is, is good enough. The, the co museum collection is lacking in paintings in the, from, the, uh, from the 30s when he was painting these richly decorative, often thinly, fluidly painted figures uh, involved in uh, the studio with multitude of textures. But this gives some sense of it uh, utilizing the textures in the background and lights and darks and so forth. In 53, we go to the next one, a painting that was in the exhibition as well at the Modern. Uh, memories of Oceania, which always brings back to mind Gauguin and his trips to the Marquesas and Tahiti to discover the simple, genuine life, in a sense. Here we have Matisse as painter and uh, constructing collage. Here we see Motherwell's origins again with the beautifully placed fragments of paper and paint and the wavering, delicately placed uh, line so I, uh, that works so beautifully with it. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful design, but again, uh, it's a fairly, uh, perhaps a fairly cold painting. Uh, it doesn't speak of the human heart, the human soul. And as such, uh, that may be, those two items, the lack of it in modern painting may be the failure of modern painting. Beautiful surface, hollow inside. OK, let's go to the next one. And we see Matisse uh, in 1953. He died about 1950. Well, I don't know if it is 1953. It's obviously in his last period. He died in 1954, was bedridden, uh, and here an invalid. Here he is in his wheelchair, cutting out his papers to make his, his well-known uh, collages, which are the final statement of his late career, and uh, are masterful, again, as decorations. But again, are as decoration implies surface, they are essentially surface statements, it, it would be my feeling of it, although the Chaucibles, the vestments, the church 
uh, robes and, and decorations that he created, uh, and which some of which are in the Museum of Modern Art, are absolutely beautiful in terms of color and a, a certain spirit, the lightness of spirit and a certain hopefulness of spirit that Matisse brings to his work. Okay, let's go to the drawing, first drawing. And uh, about 1901-1903, one of the uh, beautiful drawings uh, by Matisse, uh, solid uh, brush, brush and ink, apparently, looking from the technique, a great deal of vigor and vitality in the drawing. Matisse is a great uh, draftsman. There's just no question about it. He can draw beautifully, uh, and he draws in a variety of ways. Um, perhaps we can go to the next one over here, and we, we got another instance of that variety. And uh, people will look at it and say, my God, it's, it's kind of crude, it's, 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 it's overly simple, but look at the thigh, you know, pardon my finger, how he, he senses out the spread of the female thigh. Look at the breast being subtly raised by the fabric being pressed against it. Uh, the man is quick and fluid and working from a great deal of knowledge. We'll, we'll come back down to this one. And in contrast to that, that great linear uh, spareness and often delicacy, Matisse can carry it through to the full rounding of a form. You know, this is done in the 1920s, 1925, when he's working at his flattest, in a sense, in his painting. Uh, so that often he's drawing quite realistically and solidly as he uh, is painting abstractly. Okay, let's go to the sculpture next. We'll take a quick look at one of the sculptures by Matisse in the exhibition. The, uh, the serpentine, La Serpentine, uh, the, the serpentine figure, and he's looking for the flexibility, the almost the rubbery, free curviness of the figure. Let's go to the next one, and we see a, a photograph of Matisse at work on the, the sculpture itself. It's a little bit hazy, but we get a little bit of a back view of it at an indeterminate state uh, in its construction. Okay, let's, let's come back to me, and we'll take a quick look at uh, the next, next picture, <laughs> another graceful transition. And we see a photograph of a figure from which Matisse took, constructed that sculpture, and you can see the tremendous difference. And uh, so Matisse is working from his own aesthetic, as all artists must, and the time has come for artists to develop an aesthetic that is significant for our own time, not working from a tradition that was perhaps once great but has become weakened and it has definitely tapered off. Now, do we have one minute or are we wrapping up? We have half a minute. Okay, why don't we go to the next picture. Keep in mind the nude and we go to the next, we go to the front view of the serpentine and we can see what Matisse did it. In, in rea the reality, quote unquote, of the photograph, uh, she was a chunky, uh, well put together uh, young, young woman. Uh, in Matisse's sculpture, under the influence of, of the modernist developments, in terms of the freedom of artistic uh, possibilities, he elongates her, he thins her out. As I said, he rubberizes her, makes her flexible, and uh, uh, perhaps loses the character of the real figure but meets his own inner aesthetic. We have to meet our own inner aesthetic for the time and I would say that it is not Matisse's aesthetic, it's not Motherwell's, it's not Diebenkorn's. We have to discover our own that's effective for our own time. Thanks very much for being with us and we'll see you next time.